Let's welcome our guest host, everyone. BlackRock CEO Larry Fink is here for the hour. Larry, it's great to have you back on the Inside Track. Thanks for coming in. Let's talk about this issue that Peter and Hans Nichols were both addressing, S&P threatening to downgrade America's AAA credit. We are effectively on the brink of losing our status as the world's only technically risk-free investment. Why does nobody care? Hans pointed out that yields not only fell back down after the initial spike yesterday, but ended the day lower. Well, good morning, Eric. And uh, I think the market does care. Uh, I think that it is a meaningful and significant issue. Um, but there are many shorts in the marketplace already. Uh, the market is uh, anticipating the end of QE2. And so the marketplace is all set up for a rising yield market. And uh, yesterday's warning shot from S&P is another ex good indication that the market is technically short. And so we can't look at the implications in one day. I think that's pretty misguided. And hopefully we don't set policy for one day market moves, but we have to look at over a trend. This clearly is an indication of a bad trend. Um, it's something that should not be a surprise. You know, when we have deficits going from $300, $400 uh, billion to one and $1.4 trillion, it's a negative trend. And that trend is, uh, is why I think S&P has put us on credit watch. They're basically saying, we cannot live with these deficits of this large scale. A lot of people have, ex have been expecting one of the credit rating agencies to come out with an announcement like this for some time. Does it feel to you, though, like they're perhaps getting a little more aggressive? We've talked for so many years about credit rating agencies being a lagging indicator. It happened in Europe. S&P, or neither S&P nor Moody's, woke us up to the real threat of sovereign contagion in Europe. Is this a little more of a preemptive strike? Well, I think there's been so much criticism directed at the, at the rating agencies for, as you said, uh, missing the subprime and other problems associated with structured finance. Um, the rating agencies have been actually a good indicator in corporate credits. And I think the, they've ramped up uh, their position as to how they uh, actually act and what is considered responsible. Um, and I think what they did is a preemptive indication. It was not a downgrade, it was a warning. And we have to take that as a warning, not as a downgrade. We've been, you know, there have been other times when we had a negative watch. I think the last time was when we had all the, the fighting in Washington related to the debt ceiling in the, in the mid-90s. Uh, mid um, and so this is not the first time it happened. Uh, it, it's basically asking Washington to be responsible. Larry, let's continue our conversation and take it past the S&P's threat of a debt downgrade and into the substance of the conversation, which is really what to do about the deficit. Everybody talks about exorbitant privilege, right? The fact that the U.S. can issue debt globally in its own currency and how it can't last forever. But the question is this, what does Washington need to do to assure Treasury investors that this deficit situation we're talking about isn't going to end in tears? Well, I believe we have to, Washington has to be extraordinary in dealing with this. This has to be... That doesn't a, happen very often, well, does that's it? That's what I'm saying. <laughs> it has to be extraordinary. Um, my view is Washington, in the next three, four weeks, needs to come to terms with the scope of the deficit. My recommendation to Washington would be to... Uh, for Congress to come together and announce that they are going to cut the deficit by a minimum of four trillion dollars and they do this by May and not the content of how they're going to do it but come up with a with an agreement a commitment effectively a commitment that we're going to cut the deficit by four trillion dollars over what period of time over 10 years okay so I think this is where and it could be larger but I think as let's set that as a floor and I, from what I've been reading is both Democrats and Republicans have said four trillion Republicans may be saying more but let's start there I'm happy with four trillion dollars I would like you know I would like to see over time more but let's start with four trillion dollars Congress accepts that and then I would like to see Congress working with the president from um, May, if they come up with that commitment of a $4 trillion minimum reduction between May and October to come up with the details of what will be cut. 
And through that, we will then understand before the real electioneering uh, pattern begins, November, when we have a so one-year period. So you think it's critical for this to be done, not, not just, so the commitment to be announced before we get to the debt ceiling uh, hard I stop. I think that should be both. The, uh, the, hard, the, the debt ceiling has to be raised. Let's, we, we, you know, to me, that's a given. That's just an ir irresponsibility if we don't raise the debt ceiling. So I, I, you know, that's just going to be Wall Street, uh, excuse me, Washington drama. But the debt ceiling has to be raised. But they have to have uh, simultaneously this commitment by both parties to reduce the deficit by a minimum of four trillion. And then between May and October. Washington can come up with the details of what, where, this cut, where the cuts will be. And that's obviously the hard part. And it's important that we as voters understand what will, you know, how are we going to be cutting this deficit. And it's only fair to voters to understand how each party portrays this as we get into elections. We cannot afford to 2013. So I assume we're not going to do this in 2012. So my view is we need to do it this year before the campaigning begins. We need to do it seriously. We need to show the rating agencies, our foreign investors, ourselves, that we are resolved in really reducing the deficit. So you say $4 trillion, a, a commitment, right, a floor of $4 trillion dollars over 10 years that would reassure you and you being a relatively important person in this debate running one of the largest private investors in treasury securities in the world that would be a great commitment and i think it would also uh reduce the threat of much higher rates uh, and you know on top of the re the cessation of quantitative easing too okay well that brings up an important point should we should you would you expect to see failing such a commitment, a meaningful increase in Treasury rates? Well, that's, there's a raging debate going on uh, on that right now. Um, one would think rates would go up. Um, the, F the Federal Reserve bought $1.3 trillion of uh, securities, which represents about, you know, what, what is that, uh, uh, you know, over 10 percent of, or approximately 10 percent of the overall debt outstanding. Um, and if they're not going to buy it, we need to replace that, uh, especially with higher deficits. On the other side, though, banks because our assets are so short now, we anticipate over the next year banks are going to have their C&I loans and their structured bonds rolling off to the tune of $2 trillion. So there's certainly ample private need for more debt issuance. And they may be, you know, banks may be a big buyer of treasuries. I so think. it's no guarantee. In fact, it's, for, for the structural reasons you were just outlining, there's no guarantee that tr the, the bias is towards meaningfully higher treasury yields right now? One would think we're going to have meaningful higher uh, treasury yields, but it may not happen. The technicals are very strong. Uh, you know, but the issue for me, what really is really key, we're spending over $440 billion this year on interest payments in our debt. Before 2008, our federal deficits were never $440 billion. <clears throat> and if interest rates go up 1%, the deficit, the, the debt payments go up to five, $140 billion each period. So we could have interest payments of $540 billion, $550 billion next year. What happens if Treasury yields rise some two, two and a half percentage points? What does that mean for the American economy? What does it mean for the markets? Well, if we don't lower our deficits, it means our interest payments are going to be closer to $800 billion, which is double our historical high deficit numbers before 2009. And so we're, ta we're talking about it would have a dramatic impact on our social spending. I mean, you know, we do have to help people. Uh, we need to have some form of social spending and safety nets, and uh, we need to be building infrastructure. And so the interest payments will just be so large that it's going to, you know, you know, encroach on what government should do in helping safety nets in, in terms of people's needs. Larry, we only have about 30 seconds left in this particular moment. So do you agree with Bill Gross? It's best to short treasuries now, then, as far as the investor's point of view. No, I, I can't come up with that same conclusion at the moment because, as I said earlier, there's still $2 trillion of C&I loans running off and, and structured set, uh, bonds with banks' balance sheets. Larry, we've been talking about banking earnings. I mean, so far, they're looking pretty good. And MJ Matt's just bringing up this point, you know, getting back to what is normal. Based on what you've seen so far, what do you think? 
I think I'm not, I'm not surprised. Um, uh, they've had improvements certainly from the fourth quarter. Uh, I, I don't think we look sequentially quarter to, you know, from the first quarter of last year, there's been big changes. Uh, the, the biggest burden on banks today is the reg new regulatory costs, the higher capital, and, and that's going to be the, what I'm going to looking for in terms of earnings. What type of return on equity can they generate over the next few years? And that's going to be, you know, they're going to be under quite a bit of pressure as regulators ask them to put more capital um, uh, associated with uh, systemic risk, um, there are higher fees in terms of uh, um, um, in terms of the, what they're doing with uh, with clients and so um, I, I think business is not usual at the moment uh, but in terms of the capital markets uh, you know the, the best in breed as she said JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs are are right up there Larry BlackRock deals with Goldman maybe hundreds of times a day yes. uh, as an agency dealer as a counterparty in some trades from where you sit is Goldman any less of a firm than it was is it still as tough is it still as uncompromising is it still does it still have more information than everybody else well, I can't speak about more information but they are just as resilient just as tough just as creative as they've ever been um, they have a very deep bench um, they have consistently built from the bottom up a magnificent training program um, and so this is a, a firm that has that has been able to repeat itself and replenish itself year after year. Very few, very few firms have been able to do that, and that's you know the quality of the bottom-up growth that they've had. You know Lloyd Blankfein, Larry. Do you give any credence to this speculation that Lloyd is tired and wants to leave and is just waiting for the appropriate moment to gracefully exit the building? You know, I don't like to talk about other executives. Uh, when, when I uh, uh, see Lloyd at various meetings, he does not look uh, at tired at all. He's just as resilient, just as witty uh, as he has been for many years. Uh, one thing that we should talk about, though, with the banks, I mean, you mentioned the higher capital requirements, you mentioned the legislation. What happens when and if the Fed starts tightening? I mean, this is going to pose a, at least a headwind to the sector. It's actually positive. Let's because hear it. it will uh, it will raise rates. It, uh, you know, everybody needs higher rates. Um, banks and insurance companies are waiting for higher rates. As I said earlier, banks have $2 trillion of money rolling off. Insurance companies are sitting with uh, assets uh, shorter in terms of their maturities and their, their liabilities. So I think the financial sector is waiting for higher rates. Now, the key is, do higher rates come only in the short end and the long end flattens out? That is, not, that is negative. But if you're seeing um, a steep yield curve with higher rates, that's very positive for bank earnings. I'm not going to ask you to call the market today, but last time you were here in early March, you said you were growing slightly less constructive, as you put it, on equities, a little less confidence in the ability of equities to continue ramping up than you were in the second half of last year. How do you feel right now? I'm, I'm basically the same place. I think equity markets, especially U.S. equities, will continue to rally. Um, I think it's a safe haven in the world. Um, you know, it, we still have very high dividends um, uh, in terms of our, uh, our stock prices. Um, our earnings are increasing as we evidence of J&J. &J. Um, so I believe we have strong fundamentals in U.S. equities. And I do believe U.S. equities are the most underinvested asset class. But, I, you know, they're so still after all the money's been coming in off the sidelines. Not that much. We still have mostly people short U.S. equities versus other other areas. People were right. under allocated, in uh, other uh, words. Yes. Um, and so, uh, you know, we still believe U.S. equities will rally maybe another 8 percent between now and year end. Um, but, I, you know, I think much of it is behind us, you know, much of the rally. So we have to be a little more tentative. We need to be much more stock specific. We just can't just buy randomly. Um, but I think with all the noise related to the federal deficit and uh, uh, the potential uh, downgrading risk of the U.S. Treasuries, in my mind, it actually supports equities. Um, I, would, I think equities are, are safer in many ways uh, than any, in many other asset classes. What do you think about all the cash that's on corporate America's balance sheets? I mean, some people say the cash is a dead asset. 
Well, at zero interest rates at the moment, it is a dead asset. And we are starting to see a pickup in mergers. We're starting to see a pickup in plant and equipment uh, purchases. And we're seeing a pickup from the private sector in job creation. So some of that money is being spent, but not that fast. Their, their earnings are growing faster There's than still the a cautious tone, you think? Very cautious. And we're still sitting with $2 trillion in corporate cash. Uh, and so this is one of the fundamentals why I remain to be you know, mo modestly constructive in U.S. equities. Well, for that to change, though, interest rates are going to have to go higher. So let's go back to Treasuries for a moment, because last time you were here, you said you would be a buyer of Treasuries if yields rose above 4%. You still feel that way? Is that enough of a threshold? I, I'm still, I, I would still be a buyer if, if yields were above 4%. I think, uh, as I said earlier in the show, that with all the uh, roll-off of debt in banks, with all the needs to invest uh, further out the curve for insurance companies, uh, I think uh, there's enough demand to sustain um, interest rates to be contained. But will, <laughs> that's the question, though, will Treasury yields, 10-year Treasury yields rise above 4%? Do you think that's in the cards, given the fact that yields have been so contained, even during this debate, over the deficit? Markets are efficient. So, uh, as I said earlier, market, uh, you know, the market participants are very short right now. Um, uh, people are, want to, are looking forward to higher rates. Uh, they want to invest at higher rates so they can have a better return on their portfolio. And so the marketplace is set up for higher rates. And generally when the market is so set up for higher rates, it doesn't happen. So Larry Fink keeping us company here for the hour. All right, Larry, so do you play Angry Birds or not? If you do, you can say it. You can say I, it. I have many game apps on my iPad and Angry Birds one of them. Uh, well, well, here's a question for iPad versus Blackberry or the, ta uh, the Playbook tablet. It, Rim wants us to believe that all kinds of companies are signing up for the Playbook. Is BlackRock going to do that? Are you guys happy with the iPad? Um, I can't speak about what device we're using, but more and more people within BlackRock are using mobile devices, and I think that's going to be the trend for many years ahead. All right, Larry, before we go, we have to touch on one subject we didn't get to, which is inflation. So critical to the Treasury market, but as we've seen recently, so critical to what's going on in emerging markets in general and those economies. Well, inflation in emerging economies where food represents a higher component of, of their economy, um, inflation is raging because of food and uh, food prices. In the United States, food only represents 15% of our index. Um, so is it a threat or not for us? For the bond market. Inflation? Yeah. I don't think inflation will be a threat for the bond market in the next year or two. But once housing stabilizes, and housing represents 45% of our inflation index at this moment, once housing stabilizes and starts creeping up w w between food and housing, I think we can have but more about inflation. housing stabilizing seems far away. Two years. Two years. Two All years. Right. And gold at a record, I'm guessing that's in part to, uh, to uh, inflationary concerns. I think that's just more global instability, uncertainty. I'm not sure if it's an inflation bet. It's, it's a safe haven. All right. All right. The word on inflation from Larry Fink. And Angry Birds, actually. Less and of a word Angry on Birds. That. Larry, really it's been great to have you here on the Inside Thank Track. You. Larry Fink, the chairman and CEO of BlackRock.